Okay. So, um, welcome. On behalf of Gabelli Asset Management, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Value Investing Seminar presented by Professor Bruce Greenwald of Columbia University. My name is Federico Cribiori, as many of you know, and I'm a member of our London office here down in, uh, on Prince's Gate. Value investing has been a core guiding principle for Gabelli Asset Management since our inception in 1977, starting really with the writing of security analysis in 1934 and uh, by Ben Graham and David Dodd, value investing has remained a reliable and disciplined manner to navigate a market world frequently ruled by speculation, unjustified emotions, confusion, and momentum. The core premise of value investing is very basic, that the underlying value of a financial security is measurable and stable regardless of what the market does to it. The goal thus becomes to identify and purchase securities when their market prices significantly differ from their fundamental value. Today's value investors have been forced to become a little bit more ingenious in their ways of identifying, measuring, and defining value. From Warren Buffett to Edwin Schloss to our founder, Mario Gabelli, the disciples of value investing are plentiful in the world today, and to date, no other investment dis discipline has proved to be more successful, as Professor Greenwald will, will go into. Columbia University School of Business has for long been the house of value investing. Ben Graham and David Dodd taught there. They were followed by Professor Roger Murray, amongst others, who was the teacher of our, of our founder. And today, the mantle is held by Professor Greenwald. Professor Greenwald is a Robert Halliburton Professor of Finance and Asset Management at Columbia University. He is considered a leading expert on value investing, the economics of information, and productivity. His recent book, Value Investing, from uh, Graham to Buffett and Beyond, is widely considered the third tome on the practice after security analysis in 1934 and then Ben Graham's masterpiece in 1948, The Intelligent Investor. And I highly, highly recommend that you read it. As a former student of Professor Greenwald's, I'm truly honored to be able to introduce him to you and have him here in London to present to you. And I'm sure that you will enjoy being in his capable hands. Um, a side note along those lines, if my memory of Professor Greenwald's class serves me correctly, the more interactive this is, the more you ask questions, the happier he is. And you don't need to wait for a Q&A session at the end in order to bring, the all, bring it all out. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Bruce Greenwald. Yeah. <laughs> Let me thank Federico for two things. One is that in Italy, we started this 15 minutes late. You'll be pleased to know today we're starting just 10 minutes late. So London is still the financial and efficiency capital of Europe, at least relative to Italy. Um, second thing is that I do want you to ask questions as we go along, if there are questions. Um, as Federico said, that's going to make me happy. For those of you who have been in my classes, that may make the people who ask the questions less happy. But just remember, you're doing good for the group as a whole. And I will try and control myself and be civilized. Actually, I'm here not just to talk about value investing. What I'm really here to talk about is what a professional, well-conceived investing process looks like just in general. Now, obviously, I'm going to be making the case that the criteria that I'm going to talk about are obviously fulfilled by value investing practices and are fulfilled by value investing practices to a degree that they're not by other approaches. But there are other approaches that are characterized by investors who have been strikingly successful. There are not many of them, but at least if you do pursue those approaches, you ought to have an idea of, within the context of those alternatives, what an appropriate system for investing looks like. So this is really proselytizing to improve the overall quality of investment management. Now, value investing belongs to the genre, if you will, of fundamental investing. It involves looking at underlying securities. It involves buying securities that are trading for a third or two-thirds or half or less of their actual value. Value investing is just a matter of buying bargains in financial markets. And 
having bought bargains, holding them for a reasonably long period of time. Having described it that way, of course, the natural question I think most of you would want to ask is, is what non-value investing is? That if you're buying bargains, who are the people who are not buying bargains? And I think it might be useful just to get a sense of that. First, there's a lot of short-term approaches to investing. The most common approach to investing, at least in terms of the research that's disseminated and the discussions that occur, is what might be called short-term fundamental investing. What happens is that you forecast either a quarter out or a year out or two years out some appropriate quantity to do with the companies whose securities you're going to be buying. Most commonly, of course, that's earnings. Then you compare your forecast to the consensus either as it's apparent in surveys or as you can infer it from the stock price level of that security or the bond price level of that security. And if you think, if your forecast is more optimistic than the implied consensus, you buy on the theory that when the news is revealed and you turn out to be right and everybody else turns out to be wrong, the stock is going to go up and you're going to make money. If the opposite is true, if you're more pessimistic, again, when that becomes apparent and you're right and everybody else is wrong, then the stock is going to go down. But notice what's got to happen to do this successfully. You've got to have information that nobody else has. Now, the classic investor of this sort is my dentist, who is a terrific investor, I'm sorry, a terrific dentist and a terrible investor. His idea of short-term information is the demographics of the U.S. population. I guarantee you he is not the person who knows the most about that. But that is an alternative style of investing. And then there is a whole large school of technical investing. It's a school where all you look at is trading patterns in the market. Momentum is the simplest of those. If prices are going to go up, they've been going up, they're going to continue growing up. Some people look at fairly complicated price and volume patterns and, again, make short-term price projections. If they indicate prices are going to be higher, they buy. If they indicate prices are going to be lower, they sell. So there are plenty of alternative approaches to investment. Also, when you look at fundamentals, you can look at either companies or things like interest rates and the economy as a whole. The other dominant school of investing for many years was basically efficient market investing. The idea was that you were not going to be able to collect information better, that was better than the consensus that everybody else had collected. That Therefore, all you should worry about, since you're not going to be able to outguess the market, is minimizing transaction costs and allocating assets in a way that creates an appropriate risk profile. What I think you ought to know about that is two things. The first is, and it's really why we're here, there is overwhelming statistical evidence now that markets are not efficient. I'll show, show you what it looks like tomorrow. I'm going to describe some of it today. But there is overwhelming evidence that in all countries, in all periods of time going back now, I think these studies go back as early as the early, tw early 20th century, that there are variables that pre reliably predict returns that can be used to construct portfolios that outperform the market. And that clearly contradicts the premise that nobody can outperform the market. So it is, while it is formally not true, and it is not true in ways that obviously I'm going to talk about today, you have to understand, and I think this is the most essential wisdom in investing, that there is a sense in which absolutely fundamentally markets are efficient. And it is this, that whenever you buy a stock thinking it's going to go up, as night follows the day, somebody else is selling that stock thinking it's going down, and one of you is always wrong. Another way of saying that is that 
not everybody can outperform the market. There's a famous humorist in the United States called Garrison Keillor who tells stories about a fictional town called Lake Wobegon. And in Lake Wobegon, all the women are beautiful, all the men are tall, and all the children are above average. In this game, all the children are average on average, which means half of them are going to be below average. So that when you start to think about investing, you have to be able to answer the question, why is your manager or you yourself going to be on the right side of a particular trade? Why are you the one who's right and the person who's trading with you is wrong? And that's the most fundamental aspect of investing. Now, when we talk about value investing, there is a lot of evidence that value investors have been on the right side of the trade. That the statistical studies that sort of run against or contradict market efficiency, almost all of them show that cheap portfolios, low market to book, low price earnings portfolios, outperform the market by significant amounts in all periods in all countries, pretty much. That is a statistical, historical basis for believing that this is one of the approaches where people are predominantly on the right side of the trade, and of course somebody else has to be on the wrong side of the trade. Those studies were first done in the 1930s. They were done again in the early 50s. They were done in the 60s. The ones that, we, that have really gotten a lot of attention were done in the 90s because it was only then that the academics caught on. But there is statistical evidence that the value approaches, the buy cheap security approaches, have historically outperformed the market. The problem with that is to say, well, they may have statistically outperformed the market, but do they make money for people? If you look at large institutional investors who have pursued a value approach, they've outperformed the market significantly. The reason that's important is that 70% of professional investors underperform the market. So to see large investors from a particular discipline systematically and a large majority of them outperform the market is, again, evidence that that discipline has particular advantages. If you look at individual investors like Warren Buffett or Mario Gabelli or Michael Price or any of these people, and I'll tell you an embarrassing story about this in a second, who have gotten very rich or disproportionately rich, they are, to an extraordinary degree, concentrated among value investors. The problem it creates for me is that Mario Gabelli endowed a $50,000 prize that we give away every year for contributions to value investing. We would like not to give that to somebody for whom it is rounding error in their net worth. We would like to give that prize away to somebody with decent, who was decently poor so that it would make a difference. Well, we thought we found somebody this year when we gave away the prize for the first year. I was very pleased with myself until two weeks before we actually awarded the prize after we'd already decided and told this guy, I found out he was with worth between seven and eight hundred million dollars. <laughs> and we have a problem for the future. So in all these terms, both statistical, large institutional performance, and perhaps most strikingly, individual performance, there are strong indications that value investing satisfies this criteria of putting people on the right side of the trade. Just to talk about it, the specific assumptions that you're making as a value investor are first, and this is in Benjamin Graham's metaphor, that the market is like a partner who is manic depressive, but every day he comes to you and offers you a price for your share of the business. And if he feels good that day, the price is remarkably high. If he's depressed that day, it can be remarkably low. But market prices fluctuate a lot. This Mr. Market is a very strange guy, and there's overwhelming evidence for that. If they're fluctuating a lot and you think fundamental values are stable, and the evidence is in favor of that too, then 
prices are going to diverge regularly from fundamental values. The second assumption is more problematical. It's that you can identify which stocks are trading above or below their fundamental values. That means that fundamental values have to be measurable, and that is by no means always the case. To give you a simple example of that, I sit on these panels where we advise the managers of charitable foundations who invest money in the United States. And invariably, it's me and a bunch of people who sell money management services. And they all talk about how good they are at evaluating the, or estimating the value of stocks like Microsoft. And this was back when Microsoft was trading at 70 times earnings when it was $110 a share and comparable stocks. This was in 2000. And I always used to sit there and think, God, thank God I'm not that kind of jackass that I have to, be able to, I have to pretend to be able to do that. Because the truth of the matter is that the value of Microsoft doesn't depend on what happens in the next 10 years because the dividend return you're going to get over the next 10 years is at most 15% of the value of the stock. So what you're pretending you can do is forecast what Microsoft is going to look like in those instances from 2010 on. And if you do that, lots of luck. So it's not clear that this is always true, but we're going to talk about cases where it's true and where you can do it. And then another article of faith is that ultimately the fundamental values will out. You hold it long enough, you'll get superior returns, and the market prices of these stocks will return. And there's some substantial statistical evidence that that's the case. When you try and put this into practice, what it means is, first of all, because not all securities are going to be over or strikingly undervalued if you're thinking of going short, you have to look intelligently for things that you're going to value. Then when you estimate values, you have to be rigorous about knowing what you know. Not all value, as in the Microsoft case, is measurable, and much more importantly, as Warren Buffett has more or less recently proved, and you, as you know, he is the most successful investor in history. But as he's recently proved with respect to silver and the value of the dollar, not everybody is an expert in everything. That you are not going to be good at valuing everything. You're going to have to concentrate on what your own particular circle of competence is. The third idea is that you look intelligently for opportunities opportunities, you are rigorous about valuing those opportunities, and then you have to be patient. And Buffett has a little story he tells. He says, look, investing is not like baseball, or I guess cricket, where you have to swing at every pitch. I guess baseball it'll have to be. <laughs> you don't have to swing. They can throw as many pitches as you want. So, because value implies concentration, not diversification, you want to wait for your pitch. That's the good news. The bad news, as any professional investor knows, is that they run up the score whether you swing or not, because you're being compared to indices. So you have to have some reasonable strategy for what you're going to do when there is no obvious opportunity in these two categories. Now, all of that, it seems to me, can be described as a process. And this is where we get back to really much more than just value investing. A sensible investor is going to start with a well-formulated search strategy. Some of that is going to be screening on statistical or other bases for particular opportunities to devote resource, research resources to. But some of that is just going to be what you decide to do. It's what you're going to specialize in, because in this game, the specialists are much more likely to be on the right side of the trade than the generalists. If you know and live in Czechoslovakia and are well-connected there, 
you're likely to do a lot better investing in equities than somebody who flies in from New York and thinks they can judge what's going on. So it is also a matter of developing that circle of competence, of identifying what you're good at. And I don't care if you go to value investors or not, but when you go to any investor, there ought to be a circle of competence there. And if their circle of competence is every industry, every country, lots of luck. Second, once you've identified opportunities, you need a sound valuation technology. You want an approach to valuation that uses all the information as effectively as possible. And what we're going to talk about today is what, it seems to me, the most effective of those technologies looks like, and it's the one that was pioneered by Ben Graham. That valuation technology, among other things, should identify the critical issues that affect the future value of your investment. And you then want to concentrate on that information and any collateral indicators that will tell you, like what management is doing and so on, what it will tell you about that future value. And finally, you have to have a strategy for managing risk effectively and systematically. Now, I'm going to talk about value investing approaches to all of this. But what I hope you'll go away with at a minimum is a notion that whoever or however you invest, that all these steps are being done effectively in some degree. Now, it used to be that life was easy. That from about, certainly, 1900, Jeremy Siegel has now gone back to, till certainly 2000, which is 100 years, this is one you don't have. <laughs> I've got, look, if you ever are thinking of teaching, the thing you have to remember most about teaching is that even the very best students are only listening to you about 40% of the time. So you have to say everything three times. The problem with that, of course, is that you're listening to yourself 100% of the time, and it gets pretty tired. So if you don't change things a little bit, it's hard to keep yourself awake. This is my gesture towards keeping myself awake. That if you look historically, returns on stocks have been about 10 to 11 percent, and returns on bonds have been about 3 to 5 percent. Uh, Short-term instruments have returned even less. Buying stocks was a terrific search strategy historically. Things no longer seem to be that simple. There are basically two ways for U.S. and the foreign equity numbers don't look very different from this that you can calculate future returns. One is you can look at dividend returns plus capital gains. Capital gains are presumably driven by growth in earnings. Growth in earnings is presumably driven in the long run by growth in world GDP. It's about 4.7. It's between 4.5 and 5%. You add those two numbers together, buying stocks in the United States, and it's very similar overseas, at current valuations looks like it'll produce future returns of about 6.5% a year, 6 to 7%. A second way to do that is to do one over the price earnings ratio and add expected inflation. This number is actually these days a little higher than that. This is the earnings return. You get at low levels of inflation because stocks are real assets. Inflation gains for free. This number is probably a little lower. But again, you get about 6.5%. It's between 6 or 7%. So historically, while returns have been 10 to 11 today, probably just buying stocks, you're looking at 6 to 7. And the bad news is that's about what high-grade corporate bonds yield. So for what looks like comparable risk. So just buying stocks is not by itself a successful search strategy. What you've got to do, it seems to me, and this is what the evidence shows, is you want to start looking at things that are obscure. If you decide to buy Microsoft, you are competing with about 200 other analysts 
and about thousands of investors who are looking at that company too. That competition, no matter how smart you are, is a tough competition. That's true of all the big global large cap stocks. Ideally, to be on the right side of the trade, most often you would like to be the only one seriously studying a particular security or one of a few people. That small capitalization, small companies, small markets, particular cases like spin-offs where people get a one share for every 10 of a big company they own, and because the market capitalization is so small, they tend to dump it on the market. And boring is your friend. We will talk about why I think or why the psychological and institutional evidence is that that's going to continue to be the case. But people like high tech. People like potential lottery tickets. People like exciting securities and exciting industries. And that is not where you want to be because it minimizes the chance that you're going to be on the right side of the trade. So you want obscure and boring. And it turns out for psychological and institutional reasons, ugly in the stock market as in the marriage market, although prices are inflexible in the marriage market, is your friend that financial distress and bankruptcy people didn't use to touch. There were huge bargains there. Statistically, low growth, low price earnings, low market to book, industry problems that generate that, company problems, or disappointing performance. The reason that seems to be your friend is that those are the things that seem to get investors to dump securities reflexively. That means that the person on the other side of the trade is just getting rid of those securities. If you are an expert in that area, as the prices fall below what's justified in many of those cases, you should be in a position to take advantage of it. Finally, every so often, as when the RTC, which is the Resolution Trust Corporation in the United States, is dumping a huge amount of real estate on the market, or in the privatizations in Eastern Europe, where shares were just being dumped on the market, there's going to be a big supply and demand imbalance that's likely to create an opportunity for you to be on the right side of the trade. But ultimately, the reason you want a search strategy is so when you've done all the analysis, evaluation, and this looks to you like a bargain, you have to ask the question, why has God been so kind, or whoever it is who does this, as to make this opportunity available only to you? And the answer is, unless you're a very clean liver, which doesn't cover most of the investment managers I know, there's no good reason. So you have to have some sort of rationale to answer the question, why are you the only one seeing this opportunity? Now, the statistical studies that I talked about support these results. And this is just sort of a summary. Cheap stock portfolios, that is, portfolios of cheap stocks, and I'll show people the actual studies tomorrow, outperform the market by about 3 to 5 percent. If you do low PE and also low growth, which is you get away from the glamour stocks, you get about another 1 to 2 percent. On the other end, high market to book stocks underperform by about 3 percent. Glamour stocks, which are high growth and are trading at high PEs, underperform by about 5%. And small capitalization stocks in obscure areas, these are obscure countries, companies whose stock values have fallen so far that they're small, or tiny little companies that the big money managers just can't spend their time with because you can only put maybe five to six million dollars at most into these stocks or one to two million outperformed by about 2 to 3 percent. Statistically, historically, these strategies that we're talking about, which are the value-based search strategies, do seem to outperform. The question that you want to ask is, why do we think that's likely to continue in the future? And there, the answer to that question 
really takes two forms. The first is that most trading, as you know, is done by institutional money managers. And there are reasons why institutional money managers are, for institutional reasons, likely to concentrate in certain kinds of stocks, which will lead those stocks to be overbought and overvalued, and to therefore concentrate away from other kind of stocks that will be underbought and undervalued. Once that process starts, by the way, there is strong institutional reinforcement. You get in trouble as an institutional money manager by significantly deviating from the performance of other institutional money managers. If you just match the performance of other money managers or nearly match the performance of other money managers, you're not going to get into trouble. What's the way to do that? It's to buy what everyone else is buying. So once a trend, whether it's the Nifty 50 back in the 60s and early 70s or tech stocks in the 90s gets started, there is an institutional imperative that makes it go too far. Because money managers don't want to expose themselves to the risk of not embracing that institutional trend. That trend, we know in a way what it looks like, because there is a phenomenon that's well documented by institutions, which is window dressing. That in January or before they report their portfolios, regardless of their performance, institutions tend to buy the stocks that have done well, that have gotten good institutional research reports. It's called window dressing. And so whatever their performance has been, when the clients look at their portfolio, they say, oh, yes, that's a good gray pinstripe portfolio. I'm not upset by that. And that's, again, a phenomenon that leads to concentration in some stocks and away from concentration in others. There are also institutional reasons to concentrate on stocks that have huge potential upside. The respectable reason for that is that when you do your marketing, it helps to be able to say, well, we bought Microsoft in 1990, or we bought Cisco at the IPO in 1992, or whatever are the particular events. And anybody who's listened to marketing presentations by institutional money managers, they talk about particular successes. There is also a less respectable reason why they want to invest in that. If I'm a money manager, my compensation is an option. If the stocks in my portfolio go way up, I get paid a lot. If they go way down, it's very hard, especially when I'm starting out, for them to take the money away from me again. So that I have a big incentive to embrace risks of with large upsides, but perhaps steady downsides. Because if it's a good year, I do really well. If it's a bad year, I don't get punished. And those tend to be the big glamour stocks that have the capacity to triple, even if the expected return is only 5% as opposed to the stocks that on average will do better, but don't have that kind of dramatic upside potential. So there are institutional reasons why we think concentrating in high growth, high PE, glamour stocks is likely to continue. There are also individual psychological reasons. We're going to do the experiments tomorrow, but it turns out <laughs> If you offer people the same exact choice, but you couch it in terms of a potential loss, people will embrace risk to avoid it. If you couch it in terms of potential gain, they will then do the natural thing and act as if they're risk averse. So when you see events that are associated with loss, bankruptcy, lawsuits, industry problems, the evidence is that people irrationally avoid those risks. They oversell those stocks. Also, we know that people buy lottery tickets, which is the individual equivalent of blockbusters. All my students want to get rich in a year and a half after they leave business school. 
They're not interested in making 22 or 23 percent a year for a long period of time. And that's a regularity that's been around for a very long time. Lotteries are crappy investments, and nobody ever lost money running a lottery, even the government. <laughs> the final point is, and this is significant, you would think that people would learn that the sort of statistics that I showed you would become embedded in how people behave, because these statistical portfolios that outperform by even 3% put you in the top 2% of money managers. There are also experiments that show that people, A, suppress uncertainty, that they believe they know what they know with certainty, and that, by the way, leads them to tend to exaggerate both good news and bad news, drive good news stocks too high, drive bad news stocks too low. But they never learn. And this is an experiment that's worth talking about because it'll give you a feel for human nature. They take psychological subjects and they show them a white square against a black background. And they ask them to estimate how far away the square is. So they ask them how far away is it, and they tell them it's between 1 and 20 feet away. And they ask them to estimate the error brackets. That is, is it plus or minus a foot that your estimate is? And they all give a very precise estimate, like seven and a half feet. And they all give very precise error brackets of plus or minus a foot. What they don't tell them, of course, is the size of the square. And they vary the sizes of the square. So it turns out that physiologically, you cannot tell where that square is without knowing its size. So the true answer is it's 10 and a half feet away on average, and the error brackets are between 1 and 20 feet. People just don't seem to grasp that reality. Faced with that uncertainty, they impose the idea that they know where the square is. Then what they do is they show them the squares of different sizes. And they say, look, these squares are of different sizes. And then they run the experiment again. People are not completely stupid. The error brackets get wider. They go from plus or minus a foot to plus or minus two feet. But the people still think they know where the square is. So the fact in hindsight that they don't adjust means that there are these ingrained beliefs that just are very difficult to contradict in terms of the evidence. So when you look at these historical regularities that, as I say, were first identified, this outperformance of value portfolios, that were first identified in the 1930s and 40s, and have continued to be re-identified, it doesn't look like a big surprise when you look at the institutional and, institution and individual realities that underlie investing that these portfolios have continued to outperform. And until that institutional reality changes or the individual behavior changes, things don't look like they're going to change. So a value search strategy looks like it does extremely well. That doesn't mean it's the only search strategy that's going to do well. But you ought to remember that 70% of investors, professional investors, underperform the market. And the value search strategies outperform about 95 to 97% of other investors. But having identified where you're going to look, if you're going to employ my students, you can't just do it with a computer. If you're going to go to somebody who's going to do active research and active selection among these statistical opportunities, you have to have a process for valuing what you're looking at that actually adds something to the statistical tests. And this is the most depressing thing that I'm going to talk about here. Most of this is good news. Sanford Bernstein, which is a terrific operation, it's technically very sophisticated. They have 200 analysts, and they monitor their performance. They have outperformed the market over, I think it's about 25 years now, by 3%. That makes them, and they manage, by the way, I think it's like 400 to $500 billion now. 
That puts them in the absolute top tier of institutional money managers. If they had just done market-to-book based portfolios, they would have outperformed the market by 3.9%. So for all that work by the most successful money manager out there, they add negative 1% to their performance. So the second thing you always want to look for in a money manager is an ability to value things effectively. And again, I'm going to talk about what, in general, a reasonable valuation process looks like. And of course, the process I'm going to talk about is the Graham and Dodd value investor process. The most common way to value things that you will see all over the place are ratio valuations that an analyst will take a measure of cash flow, whether it's accounting earnings or earnings before interest in taxes or earnings before interest in taxes with amortization added back or earnings before interest in taxes with depreciation and amortization added back, and they will apply a multiple to it. A different multiple for each cash flow, but there will be a multiple. And that multiple will usually be based on so-called comparable multiples. That is what similar companies are trading for in the market, whether it's a private market or a public market. The problem is comparable is not that easy to define. Presumably companies with stronger economic positions should have higher multiples. In a cyclical situation, an industry whose cash flow is cyclically depressed should, if you're interested in long-term value, have a higher multiple. Higher leverage should lead to higher risk and a lower multiple. Management quality is a tough one. How many people think management quality should lead to a higher multiple? Of course it should. Better managers reinvest funds more effectively. How many people think management quality should lead to a lower multiple? Of course it should. Management quality is already built into the earnings. They already earn a lot because they've been good managers for a long time, and good managers have only one direction to go, which is downhill. So in that case, you don't even know what the sign of the adjustment is. But mostly it's growth that's the problem. Companies grow at vastly different levels and rates. And growth obviously adds under certain circumstances to multiples, although, as you'll see, it also reduces multiples. In fact, when you've done all this and you've asked yourself, are these cash flow levels really sustainable, you're looking at errors realistically of plus or minus 100% in these multiple estimates. In fact, of course, you can also do the multiples with a computer. You don't need an analyst to do them. So it doesn't really add anything to valuation. So this is almost an exercise in futility. And thank goodness we teach our MBAs to do something more sophisticated than that. Now, how many people in this room actually have MBAs? I know there are a lot of people here from Columbia, but. You've got to admit it if you've got them. You can't be ashamed of it. All right. What I hope you were all taught to do was to estimate future cash flows up to a certain year and then estimate a terminal cash flow, multiply it by a factor, which is usually the difference between a cost of capital and a growth rate, treat that as a terminal value, and discount all the cash flows back to the present. That is a discounted cash flow model. Anybody who's med, read any serious business research or any serious Wall Street research will have seen that done. It has two advantages. First, since you're used to the ratio analysis essentially just doing a terminal value, any diseases that this detailed approach has 
are also diseases that affect the ratio analysis. So it can't really be worse than the ratio analysis because you're thinking in a way more carefully about things. Second is it is theoretically the right thing to do. On the other hand, when you go through and calculate these cash flows, starting from revenues, margins, subtracting required investment, and then getting the cost of capital, there are a huge number of embedded assumptions. In particular, anybody who's done these models should have a sense that they are very imprecise. Why? Because almost all the value is always in the terminal value for these models. And the terminal value is usually a cash flow that you may estimate reasonably well times one over the difference between a cost of capital of, say, 10 percent and a growth rate of, say, 5 percent, which is just the growth rate of world GDP. You subtract those two, you get 5 percent. One over 5 percent is a 20 times multiple. On the other hand, suppose, and remember, this is the growth rate from, say, five years out onwards, not today's growth rate. Suppose you're off by 1 percent in that, in either direction, and 1 percent in the cost of capital in either direction. You could easily have a cost of capital of 9 and a growth rate of 6. 9 minus 6 is 3 percent. 1 over 3 percent is a multiple of 33. You could equally well have a cost of capital of 11, a growth rate of 4. The difference of those is 7 percent. 1 over 7 percent is a 14 times multiple. In the critical element of value, that's a difference of more than 2 to 1. And I assume most people who have done this have seen that happen. That is not a problem that arises from the terminal value formula. That is a problem that is fundamental to a discounted cash flow approach to valuation. And this is the second thing I think it's important for you to know. Any investment managers who are out there doing discounted cash flow measures of value are using a technique that is in practice an incredibly stupid thing to do. And it'll, there are three reasons for that, one of which will be obvious, two of which are a little less obvious. The obvious reason is, and it's what's reflected in the terminal value problem, is that you take good information, which is the near-term cash flows, and you take really bad information, which is your estimate of the long-term cash flows, and you add it together. When you add bad information to good information, what do you almost always get? You almost always get, well, you always get bad information because the bad information dominates. What you would like to do in a valuation approach is start with the pieces of value that you know are there and segregate out the bad information. That's the natural thing to do, and this approach doesn't do any of that. The second problem with the discounted cash flow or NPV net present value approach is that think about what you want a valuation approach to do. It is a rule, it's a machine for translating between the assumptions that you can make, that you can make reliably about the future, and the present day value of a security. The inputs that you want to that machine are the assumptions that you can reliably make. But think about the assumptions that you make for a discounted cash flow analysis. Suppose we were doing this for the Ford Motor Company or for Mercedes-Benz. I guess there are no more British examples that I can use. <laughs> Sorry. The DCF models are going to use or have to use estimates of the future profit rate, estimates of the future cost of capital, estimates of investment intensity, and estimates of growth rates. 
How many people think they know 20 years from now what Ford's profit margins are going to be? 10 years from now. Five years from now. But that's what the DCF model requires. How many people think they know what Ford's growth rate is going to be 10 years from now, five years from now? Lots of luck. So you're using assumptions that you're not very good at making. Well, what do you do? You do sensitivity analyses. You try all sorts of values. But these things don't vary independently. And the sensitivity analyses will usually give you any outcome you want. And that's really why the investment bankers love them. You're putting in smoke, and of course, what you get out is smoke. But let me ask you other questions about Ford and the global automobile industry. 20 years from now, will there be a global automobile industry? You can make a judgment about that. Is this industry going to be economically viable? Let me ask another question. Is Ford going to have technology that no other auto company has? Or alternatively, are other auto companies going to have technology that Ford doesn't have? And again, I think you can think about that. Finally, does Ford have access to customers that other auto companies don't? Or do they have access to customers that Ford doesn't? Does Ford enjoy competitive advantages? And that's a question you can make a judgment about. And you would like that question to be embodied in your valuation approach. The third thing is you would like your valuation approach not to throw away information. You would like it to use all the information available. And what particularly important information is never used in a DCF analysis? The balance sheet information. It just disappears in favor of earnings, which are income statement projections. So what I would like is an approach to valuation. And again, I'm going to describe one today which is the Ben Graham approach to valuation. But you ought to know that this ought to apply. It ought to organize value components from most to least reliable. So you can say, I know this much value, $8 a share is there. I'm less certain about the next $12. And the next $20 is pure speculation. It ought to organize valuations by strategic assumptions. This is the value if the industry is non-viable. This is the value if my, no companies enjoy competitive advantages, but the industry is viable. This is the value if there are competitive advantages that are sustainable. And third, you would like it to use all the information and cross-correlate that information. Well, there is a way to do that. There may be other ways to do it that I'm not aware of, but one way to do it is the way Benjamin Graham in 1935 and 36 thought about this problem, or Benjamin Graham and later as it was refined by David Dodd at Columbia. Where do you always want to start a valuation? You want to start with assets. Why? Because they are tangible. You could technically go out and look at everything that is on a firm's balance sheet. Even the intangibles like the product portfolio, you could investigate it today without making any projections or extrapolations. You could even investigate the quality of things like the trained labor force and the quality of things like their business relationships with their customers. Start with that. That's your most reliable information. It is also all that's going to be there if this is not a viable industry. Because if this is not a viable industry, this company is going to get liquidated. And what you're going to see is the value in liquidation. And that is very closely tied to the assets. In that case, with that strategic assumption, you're going to go down that balance sheet and see what's recoverable. But suppose the industry is viable. Suppose it's not going to die. 
How do you value the assets then? Well, if the industry is viable sooner or later, the assets are going to be replaced. So you have to look at the cost of reproducing those assets as efficiently as possible. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at the reproduction value of the assets in the case where it is a viable industry. And that's where you're going to start. And we'll talk in a second just a little bit and more tomorrow about the mechanics of doing that reproduction asset valuation. But that's value that you know is there. The second thing you're going to look at, because it's the second most reliable information you have, is the current earnings. Just the earnings that you see today or that are reasonably forecastable as the average sustainable earnings represented by the company as it stands there today. And then we're going to extrapolate. We're going to say, suppose there was no growth and no change, what would the value of those earnings be? Let's not get into the unreliable elements of growth. Let's look, secondly, at the earnings that are there and see what their value is. And that's the second number you're going to calculate. But it turns out those two numbers are going to tell you a lot about the strategic reality and the likely market value of this company. This is a chart you should. Oh, no, this is also a chart you don't have. But the Gavelli people will get it to you. You just have to pay attention. It's a concept chart anyway. Suppose this is a commodity business. It's a division or it's something like Allied Chemical. And you've looked at the cost of reproducing the assets. And you think you've done a pretty good job of that. And you could build or add plants, accounts receivable, cash, and inventory that represents this business, customer relationships, a product line for a billion dollars. And that's usually going to be the cost to their most efficient competitors, who are the other chemical companies. So the cost of reproducing this company is a billion. Suppose that, on the other hand, its earnings power is 200 million and its cost of capital is 10 percent, so that the value of its earnings, which mimics its market value, is 2 billion a year. What's going to happen in that case? Is that $2 billion going to be sustainable? Well, think about what's going on in the executive suites of all these chemical companies. They're going to see projects where they can invest a billion dollars and create $2 billion of value. What do these guys love better than their families? Chemical plants. So you know those chemical plants are going to get built if there's not something to prevent it and to prevent that process of entry. As the chemical plants get built, what's going to happen to the price of this chemical? It's going to go down. As the price of the chemical goes down, profit margins are going to go down, the earnings power value and the market value is going to go down. Suppose it goes down to a billion and a half. Is that going to stop the process of entry? No, not at all, because the opportunity is going to still be there. In theory, the process of entry should stop when the market value just is equal to the cost of reproducing those assets. In practice, of course, I'll do this because some of you, how many of you have kids? There's a life lesson here. How many of those kids want pets? Practically all of them. Well, there's one thing you have to know about giving kids pets. It's a hell of a lot more enjoyable to buy a puppy than to drown it later. That once those puppies are bought, you are stuck with them. And the same thing applies to chemical plants. Once those chemical plants are in place, you are stuck with them, and they are likely to stay there for a long time. So typically, the process may not stop there at all. Now, it applies equally to differentiated products. Suppose Ford 
to reproduce their assets of the Lincoln division is $25 billion, and the earnings power value and market value is, say, as much as $80 billion. What's going to happen then? Mercedes and the Europeans and the Japanese are going to look at that opportunity, and they're going to enter. Now, do prices necessarily fall? No, not in this case. They match Ford's price. But what's going to happen to Ford's volume sales? Inevitably, they're going to go down because they're going to lose sales to the entrance. What, therefore, is going to happen to their unit fixed cost? It's going to go up. Their variable costs aren't going down. So their unit costs are going up. Their prices are staying the same. Their margins are going down. And their per unit sold. And their sales are going down. So what happens to profits here? only in a different way with a differentiated product. Exactly the same thing. The differentiated products won't save you. And that will go on until the profit opportunity has disappeared. Unless there's something to interfere with this process of entry, this market and earnings power value is sooner or later going to be driven to the reproduction value of the assets, especially in the case of the Internet. You had companies that were worth, although they didn't have any earnings, 10, 5, 15 billion dollars, whose assets could be reproduced for 100 million, 10 million, 15 million. Unless there's something to stop the process of entry, the earnings to support that are not going to materialize. So what you're looking at is, if you have earnings power in excess of the reproduction value of the assets, this is going backwards a page, there had better be something to interfere with the process of entry. That's something which goes by the term of barriers to entry is actually the same as an incumbent competitive advantage. So any excess of earnings power that's sustainable over the reproduction value of the assets has, in fact, to be attributable to excess. To com it is excess earnings, and it's got to be protected, rather, by barriers to entry which are incumbent competitive advantages, the nature of which we'll talk about tomorrow. And then, and only then, should you worry about the growth. But you'll notice that in those first two cases, we've looked at value from us most reliable to next most reliable to least reliable perspective, and also in terms of our assumption about the nature of the industry, which is if there's no competitive advantage, it's the asset value which should be mirrored by the earnings power value. If there are competitive advantages, it'll show up in excess earnings, and you better be sure that they're sustainable, because that's where the value is coming from, is those competitive advantages. Now, I want to quickly talk about mechanically what's involved. I'm going to talk about this at much greater length tomorrow. Doing an asset value is just a matter of working down the balance sheet. Go through the balance sheet, ask yourself, what does it cost to reproduce the various assets? This is a hint of what that is. And then for the intangibles, list them like the product portfolio and ask, what would be the cost of reproducing that product portfolio? For the earnings power value, you have to calculate basically two things. You have to calculate earnings power, which is the current earnings adjusted in a variety of ways that I'll talk about tomorrow. And you've got to multiply it just by one over the cost of capital. There is an assumption based in an earnings power value. And part of it is being careful about what earnings are. This is just a picture of what some of those adjustments look like. You've got to adjust for any accounting shenanigans that are going on. You've got to adjust for the cyclical situation, for tax, particular tax situations that may be short-lived, 
for excess depreciation over the cost of maintenance capital expense and really for anything else that's going on that is causing current earnings to deviate from long-run sustainable earnings. So it's long-run sustainable earnings multiplied by one over an appropriate cost of capital. What you've got then are two pictures of value. You've got an asset value and you've got an earnings power value. And now you're ready to do serious analysis of value. If the picture looks like case A, what's going on, assuming you've done the right valuation here, if it's an industry in decline, you haven't done a reproduction value when you should be doing a liquidation value. What it means is that you'll have, say, $4 billion in assets here that's producing an equivalent earnings value of $2 billion. What's going on there if that's the situation you see? It's got to be bad management, that the management is using those assets in a way that is not producing a comparable amount of distributable earnings. In this case, the critical issue is almost always, it'd be nice if you could buy the company below both asset and earning power value. But typically, you pay the reduced earnings power value, and all this asset value is sitting there. In that case, you're going to spend your time reading the proxies and concentrating on the stability or hopefully lack of stability of management. That in that situation, the issue is pre preeminently a management issue. And the nice thing about the valuation approach is it tells you the current cost that that management is imposing in terms of lost value. That is not something that is revealed by a DCF analysis. And there are a whole class of value investments like that. And one of the great contributions to the theory of this business is Mario Gabelli's idea that really what you want to look for in this case is a catalyst that will surface the true asset value. And you can wait. Sometimes that catalyst may be Michael Price or Mario Gabelli if they own enough of the company. I would like to encourage you, if you're big investors, to make that catalyst you. The second situation is this one, where the asset value, the reproduction of the value of the assets and the earnings power value are essentially the same. That tells a story, just like any balance sheet and income statement tells a story. It tells the story of an industry that is in balance. It's exactly what you'd expect to see if there were no barriers to entry. And if you look at this picture and then you analyze the nature of the industry and you say, for example, this is the rag trade. I know in the rag trade there are no competitive advantages. You now have two good observations on the value of that company. If it were ever to sell for a market price down here, you'd know that's what you're getting, that you're getting a bargain from two perspectives, from both the perspective of the assets and the current earnings. Buy it. We have ignored the growth, but I'm going to talk about the growth in a second. The last case is the one that we really first talked about, where you've got earnings power in excess of asset value. The critical issue there, especially if you're going to buy the earnings power value, is, is that earnings power value sustainable? And that requires an effective analysis of competitive advantages in the industry. And what I'm going to talk about for the second half of tomorrow is how to calculate or how to think about that analysis. All right, what I'm left with then is the growth. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. So I've looked at the earnings power. I've looked at the asset value. I've looked at the critical issues to which they give rise. Now I'm going to look at the growth. 
And actually, at this stage of the game, looking at the growth is surprisingly easy. The standard view of short-term analysts is that growth is always valuable. That is wrong. Growth is relatively rarely valuable in the long run. And you can see why with some simple arithmetic. Let's just look at growth. And I'm not going to look at it from the growth rate of sales. I'm going to look at it from the perspective of the investment required to support the growth. Now, the investment required to support the growth is zero, then of course it's profitable. But that happens almost never. At a minimum, you've got accounts receivable and other elements of working capital to support growth. Suppose the investment required is 100 million, and I have to pay 10% to the investors who supplied that 100 million dollars. The cost of the growth is 10% of 100 million, which is 10 million. Suppose I invest that 100 million in growth at a competitive disadvantage. I'm Walmart, and I decide to invest that money competing with a well-entrenched competitor in southern Germany. Am I going to earn 10% on that investment? Almost never. If that case, I'll be lucky to earn anything. I may earn $6 million, but the net contribution of the growth is the $10 million cost to the funds minus the $6 million benefit, which is minus $4 million for every $100 million I invest. Growth at a competitive disadvantage has negative value. Suppose it's an industry like the automobile industry or most industries with no barriers to entry. It's a level playing field. Well, sooner or later, the return on that $100 million is going to be driven to the 10% cost by the entry of other competitors. So I'm going to pay $10 million. I'm going to earn $10 million. The growth has zero value. The only case where growth has value is where the growth occurs behind the protection of an identifiable competitive advantage. So growth only has value where there are sustainable competitive advantages. And in that case, usually, what barriers to entry means is that there are barriers to companies stealing market share from each other. There's usually stable market share is symptomatic of that last situation. That means that in the long run, the company is going to grow at the industry rate. And in the long run, almost all industries grow at the rate of global GDP. So in these three situations, the growth only matters down there in the last one. And the critical issue in valuation is either management and the value in the Graham and Dodd approach will tell you the extent to which that's important. Or you have a good, reliable valuation and there's no value to the growth because there are no barriers to entry. Or it's down here. And there, obviously, if you can get the growth for free, you could pay a full earnings power value and get a decent return. Now, just to summarize about growth, growth at a competitive disadvantage destroys value. Growth on a level playing field neither creates nor destroys value. And it's only growth behind the protection of barriers to entry that creates value. In terms of process, then, what you start with is a search strategy that's designed to answer the question, why is this opportunity available only to me, is designed to focus your resources effectively. You want a valuation technology that works well, that uses all the information, that uses in particular the judgments that you can make about the nature of the industry, and that organizes value components by reliability class. 
And I've suggested one that does that, which is obviously the Graham and Dodd approach. Conceivably, there are others out there. You would also like then this valuation technology to identify key issues. You would like any potential decision once it's been thrown up by your search strategy or identified by your search strategy, it's been valued in terms of valuation, it looks like a bargain, you want to then review the appropriateness of that decision. Why? Because remember, you have to be sure that you're on the right side of this trade. The first part of reviewing any valuation assessment is to understand what the key issues are that underlie that purchase decision. If you're buying earnings power, especially if implicitly you want the growth, the crucial issue is the strength of the franchise. It is not the growth rate. Anybody who has a strategy of buying companies whose growth rates are above their PEs is an idiot. Growth only has value if it's a strong franchise, and it's significant that the successful buyers of growth, the successful growth investors like Warren Buffett, and to a lesser extent, one of my ex-students called William Von Muffling, who's got a shorter but outstanding record, focus on the strength of the franchise as reflected, among other things, by returns on capital. If you're going to buy growth, that is going to be the critical issue. Its strength and its sustainability, and therefore the issue of competitive advantage. If you're buying assets, the crucial issue is going to be management. And you're going to want to look for Gabelli-type catalysts to make sure you're just not going to get your money trapped with the old management, and they're not going to you earn a decent return for you. You want to then look at collateral evidence. Are the insiders buying or selling? It's not determinative, but it's something you want to look at. If you think it's a great opportunity and the insiders are selling with both hands, my advice is to look at it again. Who are the insiders? They're usually management. You want to see who the other investors are. Obviously, it's critical in the management case. You've got five activist investors who own 44% of the stock who are good activist value investors. That's a good sign. If it's a green mailer who's going to go away, that doesn't do you, who's going to be bought off, that doesn't do you any good at all. Usually, if it's in his area of expertise and Buffett is buying it, that's a reassuring sign. So you want to look at who else is buying and selling this, particularly the investors and insiders, and that information is available. The last thing you've got to look at is, remember, those psychological biases that we talked about are deeply ingrained. And the bad news is they apply to you as much as to anybody. So you have to track rigorously, or your investors have to track rigorously their own performance. You can make a mistake once, that's fine. But if you make it again, that's not a good idea. So you have to have a good search strategy, a good valuation technology, careful review of the crucial issues, and you have to have a good strategy for managing risks. In value investing, the fundamental way you manage risks is to know what you're buying. Now, that means that there are certain risks that you ought not to be exposed to and certain risks that you're prepared not to worry about. And I think the best example of this that I can think of, does everybody here know what a REIT is, an REIT? It's basically a security that's backed by real estate investments. If you look at a building, the building generates income. If you buy the building based on the income it's generating, you ought not to worry much about fluctuations in the value of the building if you're a long-term investor. On the other hand, if there are fluctuations in the real estate market and the value of that building, you do want to worry about those too because you may have to generate liquidity. So that you want to worry about 
earnings powers of the companies that you're buying. You want to worry about assets. But suppose the real estate returns are the same, the values of the buildings are the same, but the price of the REIT is fluctuating all over the place. Do you care about that last risk? You want not to. That last risk is purely financial. It's purely the market being irrational. And if you know what you're buying, but you get caught by one of those fluctuations, you ought not to care that much. If the franchise is there, it's earning what it was earning, the asset values continue to be there, fluctuations in stock price ought not to be your primary concern. It's understanding the value and the earnings power of the buildings that you care about. On the other hand, to protect you against those fluctuations and to earn above normal returns, you want a margin of safety. You don't want to buy something 10, 5, or 15 percent below your estimate of its fundamental value. You want to buy it for a 30 percent or a 50 percent or more discount. Those are basic ways to manage risks that you think people would worry about. What price am I paying and what am I buying and how sure am I about the characteristics of that? And those are essentially the key ways in which value investors manage risk. Beyond that, diversification helps. But if you're fully diversified, of course, you're just going to be buying the market. If you're fully diversified, you're not going to be an expert in any particular securities. So some diversification, certainly, but inevitably, if you're looking for above average returns, you're going to be concentrated and you're going to come back to these things. For asset buys, catalysts are things you want to look for. If it's a bargain, if it's the asset value is $100 a share, it's trading at $25 a share, and has been trading at $25 a share for years, you don't want to buy it at $25 or $30 a share until you see events like a takeover, a deathly disease in the family of the owner, activist investors getting involved that are likely to surface that strategy. And finally, you want investors to be patient. The, end of the biggest generator of risk is people <laughs> who are bored buying things that seem like a good idea at the time, who are people under pressure doing things that they feel they have to do. So you want somebody with a good default strategy. What's a default strategy? It's what you're going to do when you don't have any good active ideas. If you're dealing with family money that's very risk averse, the obvious default strategy is cash. If you're an equity manager, the obvious default strategy is just to buy the index. But it's clearly something like an efficient markets portfolio allocation because this is the world where you don't have good active ideas. But if you have a good default strategy in place, you're going to be patient enough not to do stupid things. In general, therefore, what you're looking for in investment management is a good search strategy, a good valuation technology, a good review process, and a sensible risk management strategy. Value investors, it seems to me, both historically and in theory, have done extraordinarily well in all those areas. But if you find other investors who meet all those criteria, by all means, embrace them. Thank you. I think I'm just on time.